when you're first opening up a business, all you do is look for cash. I mean, of course, that's what you're going to do because I mean, funding money is everything. And it's really easy to fall into the trap where trap where you spend all your time and effort trying to find clients and find cash. But there does come a time when you have to start working on the business as much as in the business. Our guest today has an intentional and unique approach to figuring out how to create this white space and how this has also impacted her culture and her people. Juliet Starrett is the co-founder and CEO of The Ready State, Inc., which has pioneered muscular skeletal self-care and recovery. Her co-founder is also her husband, and their relationship is also really unique and special in how they think about culture and how they think about their team. I want to chat with her today about not only how she's created this white space and the impact that it's had on her business, but also what it's been like to be a female entrepreneur working alongside our partner. Juliet Starrett, welcome to How I Turned the Corner. Thank you so much for having me, Kendra. I'm delighted to be here. Yes. So, all right. So let's start actually by talking a little bit more about your business. So just briefly, tell us a little bit about what you guys do and, you know, kind of what, who, who's on your team. Sure. So uh, as you mentioned, we uh, co-founded a company called The Ready State. If anyone has ever been involved in the fitness business, we used to be called Mobility Wad and we rebranded in 2019. So, you know, in case that, in case that name rings a bell for anyone, um, but we were really at the forefront of um, this idea that people should be able to take a crack at fixing their own musculoskeletal pain and injury. Um, and with the goal of being able to move better and feel better and sort of live more freely and fully because you can be in comfortable in your own body. So we were really at the forefront of creating tools and strategies for people to be able to take care of their own bodies. Um, mechanically, how we do that is we offer a subscription product that's called Virtual Mobility Coach. People can subscribe and receive content on how to fix nagging pain and injuries. We have daily follow along mobility videos. If you just want to, you know, feel good in your body and feel less stiff after sitting all day or whatever it is you do in your day. Um, we have a lot of sports specific um, tools and strategies for, you know, over 50 sports and movements. So, you know, if you're a golfer and you want to learn how to warm up and take care of your tissues after your golf game, we have content for those kind of people. So it's really wide ranging. Um, it's really for people who want to use their body to do something. And I, I want to make a clear distinction that, um, there are certainly a subset of people out in the world who might use the word athlete to describe themselves. And, our product is for them, but it's also for people who just want to be able to feel good in their body. And if that means, you know, three times a week, they go hiking with their friends and they want to make sure that they don't have ankle pain or knee pain or hip pain while they're hiking with their friends. Like, like it's it, what we do is also for those people. Um, so it's okay. really for anyone who wants to feel good, be able to do the things that they love doing well into their old age physically, um, whether that's gardening or climbing Kilimanjaro, right. um, very <laughs> wide ranging. And we, you know, we also sell some mobility tools and we teach courses to professionals. So we also teach physical therapists, chiropractors, physicians, massage therapists, how to use our tools with their own clients. Um, and so we've been doing that. We also used to own a brick and mortar gym for many years, for 17 years. So for a while we had two businesses. Okay, great. So, so, so tell us about your team. Who, who do you have on your team? So we are really small and mighty. We like to say, um, we have a core group of six employees, um, and then a network of, um, contractors and agency partners, uh, largely in the technical and the technical side of our business website developer types, and then a lot of marketing agencies and contractors, um, you know, people that we can't afford their talents to have full-time in-house. We, we outsource to agencies, agency partners. So we have another seven or eight agency partners. Um, when we owned our gym, we had as many as 30 employees at any given time. So we've had phases where we've had you know, between two separate companies, as many as, you know, 45 employees and agency partners. Now we're down to about 15 total, um, you know, combined between agency partners and employees. So very small. 
Yeah, no, that's great though. So, so what, why, I mean, when we pre-interviewed you, you had such a great focus on culture and people. Where, where did that come from? You know, I, um, I think it comes from the fact that we are accidental entrepreneurs. Um, I'm actually a lawyer by training. Um, so I'll start by saying that I got my professional chops in the world working in a huge corporation. I worked at one of the biggest law firms in the country with 5,000 attorneys. And, you know, I don't even know how many support staff, um, but it was a big, huge corporate environment where I wore a suit and, you know, I dealt with all the sort of craziness that is working in the corporate world. Um, so I know what that is like. Um, and I specifically left that environment. Um, and there were, 25 different reasons why I left my law practice to go be a full-time entrepreneur, way too many to go into into this podcast. Um, but one of them was that I really wanted to be able to sort of like see, sort of manage my own destiny as a human and be able to be a mom to my kids, which I could see a pathway more in, in an entrepreneur space for that. Um, but I think the fact that I'm an, an accidental entrepreneur, and by that, I mean that, you know, we started both of our companies because we saw a problem that needed to be solved and started the business for that reason. We never made a business plan and went out and raised money. And we never started these businesses with a goal to actually have them be able to pay our mortgage. That's been a side effect of running our business. It wasn't the original intention. So I think because I have this background in corporate America, I know what it is to work in a big, huge corporation. And I know, I know about the politics and the culture of a big corporation. Um, and I decided that wasn't for me. So that's number one. And then number two, I didn't set out to start two companies to like make tons of money and have a fancy exit and, you know, be able to like buy a third home and in, you know, Montana or something like that. That was never my intention. And so I think those two things really inform my focus on culture within my company. Mm -hmm. That's great. So, so share, share one of the podcasts I heard you do in the past, you talked about kind of creating this white space on your calendar that gave you time to think, which I really want to bring up to our founders and entrepreneurs, because I feel like for me, when I'm in that space of having some white space, that is really when I start spending more of my time and effort thinking about my people it's kind of yeah. a frantic pace to be in when you're, um, you know, thinking about your products and cash and those, all those other pieces. But when I sit and rest is when I think about my team. It, tell yeah. me about your experience with your white space on your calendar. Yeah, well, I mean, I will say that it's clutch because, you know, as you know, running a small business, I mean, there are, and, you know, I would describe myself as a very operational CEO. And, you know, by that, I mean that we're a very small company. So I'm not just, you know, sitting in the background, you know, reading financials all day long. Like I am in there doing things, including in menial tasks and administrative tasks. Like I'm very operational in my role. So yes, I am doing the forecasting and planning and strategic work. But in that, I'm also like making spreadsheets. <laughs> so so uh, because of that, my calendar and is very full. And if I don't actually block off some time to think or read or reflect, it literally doesn't happen. There's not enough hours in the day. Um, and my calendar gets gobbled up by meetings and, you know, you, you guys all know what that's like. So, um, so first of all, the, the key for me was actually creating the space, which I, I will tell you, I didn't do until I'd already been an entrepreneur for like seven years. So I was like slow to the punch on this. But what I saw was always just feeling like, oh my God, I just don't ever have time to think or read or, you know, stay connected to the, um, you know, what's going on in my industry, um, stay up to date on technology. Like I wasn't giving myself the space to do that, but knowing that it was so important for me to be effective in my job to actually have that white space. So, I mean, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of blocking it off on the calendar. The other thing that I've learned about myself is that, and you know, my whole mission in life is getting people to move more. You know, that's like what I'm passionate about as a human is just like getting people out moving more, whatever that means for them. So the way that I find my white space to be mo most effective is actually walking. Um, something about moving and having the chance to think, um, you know, un uninterrupted is where my best sort of creative thinking about running a company and how to be a good manager and, you know, what we can do to support company culture. Um, th that's where that happens for me. So it's calendared. And if at all possible, it's done while I'm walking. Mm -hmm. 
That's great. I love that. Yeah. I find some of my best uh, ideas come while walking as well. So I'm not usually somebody who's listening to things or even, you know, with somebody else when I'm walking, like I am by myself and my gut, if I have a headset in, it's listening to like lightly listening to classical music or something like that. So that yeah. I'm not super distracted, you know, and feeling the need to dance. <laughs> if it's, <laughs> if it's a little Harry Styles or something, right? And that I come up with my best ideas in those times. So I'm completely with you on that. Um, so tell us then about like, what, t- how would you describe your culture? Um, well, I, I stro- I, I've been asked this question before and I, I, I'm, I need to think of a better vocabulary word, but we really do have a very family vibe within our company. Um, you know, we, uh, uh, and what I mean by that is I know my employees and I know them personally, and I take it upon myself to know what's going on in their outside of work life. I know what their kids are doing. I know what struggles they're facing raising teenagers. I know what they did on the weekend. Um, You know, I care about what their life is like, um, what trips they go on, who they're hanging out with. Like, I actually really genuinely care and I'm interested. So, you know, I just actually make an effort to stay up to date with what's actually going on with my staff. Um, You know, that's just something that's very important to me. I know them. I know what's going on in their lives. You know, I try to stay connected to stressors in their lives. Um, I also play the long game, you know, over, over, you know, having employees for 20 years. Like, let me give you an example. I've had three or four employees who've gone through divorces while they work for me. Um, and what I know when you have an employee that's going through a divorce is that they're not going to be the number one, most efficient, amazing, epic employee during that period of time. And I can think of numerous other stressors. A parent gets sick, a child gets sick, you know, whatever. I I actually am fine with that. I go in saying, okay, I super value this employee. They've been loyal and an amazing worker for me. And I'm going to go into the next six to eight months knowing that they're probably going to be 50% mentally available for my company. And I'm going to need to maybe you know, make sure other people are kind of bolstering their job or whatever, but I don't feel mad or annoyed or resentful about that. I, you know, my goal is to have, I don't want to have turnover. I turnover is not good. I mean, obviously there's times and places when you have to have turnover if there's a bad fit or something's not working or, you know, again, I also hope my employees are always happy. And if they find happiness somewhere else, great. But I, you know, turnover is expensive and mentally time consuming and financially expensive and, you know, impacts the company culture when you have new people come in. So, you know, I want to avoid having turnover. And I also know that people go through difficulty in life and, it's part of my job to give people the space where maybe they're not always going to be the number one, most amazing, efficient worker, crushing 12 hour work days and, you know, having their greatest KPIs they've ever had in their life. Like that's not my expectation. Now the downstream impact of that is I'm probably never going to be running a $50 million company. You know that, I mean, there's some choices that I make in terms of how I run my business and how quickly I expect to grow. Um, that I can make because I'm not trying to be a $50 million company. I'm a small company. I want to continue growing. I want to impact and help more people with the work that we do. Um, I want to see success in our business. Um, but I also don't need to see such rapid success that it's at the expense of being able to give someone space to be able to like go through a divorce, Mm -hmm. for example. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think, I think the word, if I could fill in for you, is community. Yeah. I mean, it isn't, it isn't a family. I've mentioned this before on the podcast. It's not a family because we do, you know, fire people, right. Or they move on. Right. Um, but I do think it's a community just like a neighborhood, right. You care for your neighbors, you care for a church community or a, a, you know, a, a gym community. And, and so same with the, our employees, it's the same way. And I've had just amazing situations over the years where I've, I mean, I'm still in touch with almost all my former employees and on a friendly basis. So, you know, we exchange Christmas cards. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm able to support them and help them and vice versa. We get, I mean, I've had an employee that I actually fired that 
later on brought us business. <laughs> you know? it's like, right, okay. it was right. Yeah. And I think you're right. I mean, community is such the right word. And if we all, we all know the data about the fact that we are spending the most time in our entire lives, you know, like if you count your days of your lives and the hours of, you know, you spent the most time at and work, the best, yeah. the most and the best time at work. So, I mean, I can't imagine working at a place now, especially without that sense of community and without feeling like, and, and by the way, my employees have massively supported me too. Like, you know, not to be a downer, but I had breast cancer three, four, excuse me, four years ago. Um, and I had to go, I was had very early stage breast cancer, but I had to go through some surgeries and take time off work. And, you know, the people who were like bringing me lunch and checking in on me and folding my laundry were my employees mm-hmm. coming by my house, right. To, to help take care of me. And, you know, so it, it's, we've created this supportive community and it's, it's, I mean, it's what I love the most about what I do. Yeah. No, I agree completely. I've had the same experience. I think a lot of people forget that, that when you are, when you care, you're cared for. And, um, it's a two way street. It's not, it's, it's, it's not somebody taking advantage of you or, or anything like that. Like they're, they're literally going to be there for you when you have cared for them. And I do think that that is like the number one thing we can do as founders and entrepreneurs is, is care for our employees and they're going to care for our business. Amen. Amen. Yeah. I yeah. can't agree more. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to hear about the breast cancer. That must've been a very stressful time. It was stressful, but um, I feel gratitude and luck about the whole thing. So it's all good. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So, all right. I want to shift gears a little bit because I think you and I have another thing in common, which is that we both have amazingly supportive spouses. So I don't want to focus this so much on just being a female entrepreneur because I'm a little over that conversation, honestly. Um, I haven't really encountered the things that a lot of other women have, you know, expressed or been fighting for. Like I've rarely felt discrimination. I just go and do my job, right? And get it done and kick butt. But I do think that there's a great conversation we could have around what it what does it really mean to have a supportive spouse? Because I think it's hard. And women think they should have to do it all. Um, they should have to be the, the primary care provider for their kids, the primary care provider for the home and the things that have to happen around the home, as well as then there just be this rock star entrepreneur. And it's absolutely impossible to do that if you don't have a supportive spouse. No, no. I mean, I do have to tell you one quick story, which is not about a supportive spouse, spouse but it's about support. Um, and this has stuck with me so uh, so much when my kids were babies, I was still working full-time as an attorney. Um, and I had one of those moments where I, I looked at this other female attorney and I'm like, how do you do it? Like, how do we survive this? You know, how do we have these jobs and, you know, raise children and, you know, take care of the home stuff. And she, she said to me, she's like, you need to hire people to help you. You can't. So, I mean, that's my number. One of my strategies is the notion that you can be a mom and an entrepreneur and work full-time and run a company and actually, you know, have time to go on a date with your spouse and, you know, all the things that come with life. Like, first of all, I I can't emphasize to everybody enough, like if you can afford it and if you have a crazy life, like do not be shy about hiring external help, whether that's babysitters or a, you know, a housekeeper or you name it. Um, But yes, I mean, having a supportive spouse is the only reason that I'm even, you know, if I didn't have a supportive spouse, I would still probably be working as an attorney and sort of my guess is have a lot less life and professional satisfaction than I currently have. Um, you know, as with any relationship, including working with employees, I think communication is the key. Um, and I think over the years, Kelly and I, especially on the home front have sort of figured out like who's going to do what and how can we make sure that it feels equitable since we, you know, both are working full time. Um, and I think the other thing that's helped us so much, especially on the business side, is that we do have such different skill sets um, that, you know, we aren't clashing often. What he does and what I do are very different on a day-to-day basis. I think that has really helped our working relationship be extra successful. And, you know, about, I mean, we definitely have friction and we, you know, I, I mean, we're like any long-term relationship, you know, there are challenges, but but overall we've worked very well together. Um But I think the other thing that is key, and this is sort of a a point on female entrepreneurship, this I think is partly because in our relationship and in our business, Kelly's the kind of front man of the business. He's like the face of the business and sort of like the star, for lack of a better word. Um, 
so Kelly gets a ton, a ton of external acknowledgement. You know, people are like, Kelly, you changed my life. Kelly, you changed my life. Oh my God, your book changed my life. Kelly, you're so amazing. Like he gets a ton of external engagement from the world. Um, I, as the behind the scenes person, get no external acknowledgement. Um, and I'm not saying that in an emo way, by the way, I don't feel emo about it at all. Um, it just is, I don't get a ton of external acknowledgement for the work I do. And so one of the things that's been so great about what Kelly's done is he kind of has filled that gap. Um, and he, and also my own employees, um, you know, I do, I do, the best job I can do to try to make sure I always acknowledge and share my gratitude for the hard work my employees do, but they do the same for me. And so does Kelly. And I think that actually kind of um, evens out this weird dynamic of Kelly being the star of the business and me being the behind the scenes person, as I think they, they, and he do a really great job of being like, I see you, I see the work you're doing. And that's all I need. I don't need to be told I'm the best or I'm amazing or whatever. But, you know, every human, whether you're running the company or you're an employee, like people just want to feel seen for mm -hmm. what it is they're doing. Um, and I have a funny story to tell you about this. So I worked for years in my 20s as a whitewater rafting guide, as a guide. Um, and I worked for this man named Bill McGinnis at this legendary rafting company called Whitewater Voyages in California. And he's a, he himself is a legend because he was, he ran the first ascents of a bunch of California rivers. Um, but like deep down, he was like this really funny guy who was kind of a hippie and, you know, he was kind of a horrible businessman. Like he was an amazing river runner and amazing around a campfire, but like not the greatest business guy, um, a whitewater rafting company is also not an easy business to run, but he did this thing, which was so influential to me when I was working for him, when I was 20 years old, he literally would just stop. And like, you know, you, at, at the time when you're 19, you're like, this guy's kind of a weirdo, but looking back on it, he would stop. And in kind of a slow way, like look me right in the eye. And he would be like, I really appreciate you, Juliet. And he would like, you know, and we all would kind of laugh and make fun of him at the time because we were teenagers or young 20s. And we're like, oh my God, Bill's so funny. Like, did you see how he said, I appreciate you or whatever. But it's it's really actually informed how I, and and really helped me at an early age, see how even though we kind of like to joke about it at the time, how really impactful that is and how important it is, you know, both in a relationship with your spouse, who in my case is also my business partner, but in your professional relationships, like people want to be seen. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh for sure. I really want to make sure my people feel seen. And I also am so grateful because I know they see me and I know because they tell me mm -hmm. it's awesome. It's, it's one of those things that I always just mystifies me. There's a couple of things that I'll hear business leaders say that I'm like, why? And one of them is why should I thank them for doing their job? And I'm like, why not? It's two <laughs> words. And I mean, even when they haven't done it perfectly, I will say to my team, like, thank you so much for putting this proposal together. And we need to fix a couple of things here. Let's go back to paragraph whatever. And, you know, maybe we should add this in and I'm giving yeah. them the feedback. It's not perfect, but I, I mean, they put a ton of effort into something for me. Let's say, thank you. It's not that big of a deal. No, I'm not, not hard. creating yeah. entitlement with that or anything. So yeah, I'm yeah. completely with you on that being seen. I love that. So back to you and Kelly. Um, I mean, I feel like, I mean, I'm, let me acknowledge also, I completely agree. Like no, no man, if we're going to just compare this purely male and female, no man if would ever go about life thinking that they have to clean the house and make it perfect and like have a perfect dinner. I, I mean, I don't know if I've ever in my life heard a man say something like that. I hear plenty of women say that, like nobody yeah. can clean my house as well as me. I'm like who cares? Right. Yeah. I mean, that's my philosophy on it. And so <laughs> one of the things that I always encourage people to do is to sit down and kind of make a list of the things that a, you're really good at and you love doing and is moving the business forward. B, you are, you like doing and you're good at, but you probably could train someone else to do it. Mm -hmm. C, you're really good at it, but you hate it, mm -hmm. which you absolutely need to delegate that to somebody. You hate doing it 
and you're bad at it for sure. Yeah. Delegating that. And then the last <laughs> one is you love doing it, but you actually aren't very good at it, yeah. <laughs> which yes. is an opportunity. Like I'm not that great of a singer, even though I really, really like performing, yes. <laughs> but nobody really wants to hear me sing. <laughs> and so, um, so with you, like, did you go through an activity like that, that helped you figure out where you were going to delegate and where you were going to kind of bring some helpers in? Yeah. So I, um, one of the books that I, it has influenced me a lot and I, I would say it's a slim book and I can kind of, uh, summarize it for you here, but it's actually called who, not how. Um, and it's, it, um, a small book and I didn't think it would have as much of an impact as it has had on me, but it's a similar idea to what you're talking about with the exercise you did, which is what we often do as entrepreneurs, because you know, one of the things, especially as a small business entrepreneur, you get so good at is figuring things out. Like, like that's like a hallmark. Like if you're not someone mm-hmm. who can just figure out, like you don't, you're never going to know how to do everything. You're never going to know how to hire your first employee. You're never going to know how to, you know, turn on a 401k program that you can run as a fiduciary. You're never going to know how to do those things. You just figure it out. That's what entrepreneurs do. Like that's what I think is one of the main parts of the job. Um, but because we have that instinct, we often mistakenly ask our, ourselves, okay, I have a task ahead of me. How am I going to do it? And this book really says that you've got to retrain your brain to say instead, who is going to do it before you say how? And part of that is then you go through those exact same questions you asked, you know, to figure out the who is should it be me? Maybe in some instances it should be me. But, you know, if we're going to talk about like running a Facebook ad campaign, um, you know, I'm smart. I'm resourceful. I could probably figure out how to run a Facebook ad campaign, but it's not a good use of my time. It's not my area of expertise. There are people out there who do this as their sole job. Um, And so rather than my spending three weeks figuring out how to run a Facebook ad campaign, the question I need to be asking myself instead is who should be running my Facebook ad and how am I going to find that person? Um, So that, that sort of mental shift has really helped me a lot because I will say that um, I fell into that trap in my, you know, or my first business was a brick and mortar gym. And um, it took me way too long to actually hire a manager for those exact reasons you're talking about, which is, oh, I don't want to train somebody and nobody's going to do as good a job of me. And nobody's going to have as attention to detail and, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, you know, all those things we can tell ourselves. Um, And then I hired my first manager after owning a gym for like seven years, by the way, way too long, like a ridiculous amount of time doing everything myself. Um, And, and you know, it was so obviously both helpful to me, um, decompress my own life, made me a happier person, but also helped us grow the business because we had another person. I mean, it was just like, so, so that was, that was so delayed and the impact of hiring that person was so obvious that I fortunately was able to kind of change my mentality there. So I really couldn't agree more. I mean, I approach it from the like who, not how philosophy, but yes, the other thing I'll tell you though, we do the same kind of questions at home. Like, let me give you an example. I'm really good at folding laundry. I hate, hate it folding laundry. I hate it. I, and it takes forever and it's a multi-part process. It's not just moving things through. You got to fold it all and then get it to the right room and make sure people stalk your kids about putting it like everything about the process. I hate, like I find it to be unpleasant. It's time consuming. It's the last way I want to spend my time in my weekend. And, you know, Kelly and I actually had this as like an actual conversation where we sat down one night and I was like, I have to talk about the laundry. I hate folding laundry. I I find that it's a horrible use of my time. I feel sad when I'm doing it. It takes forever. It takes away from me doing things I want to be doing. And he's like, awesome. I'll do the laundry because he likes to do it. He loves to listen to audiobooks. He's an only child. So in fact, in some ways, in a house full of teenagers and kids and chaos and dogs, he sort of likes being able to like escape into his book and fold laundry. So it's like, you know, it's worked out perfectly, but we actually had to have that conversation. I had to identify for myself how much I hate folding laundry deeply. Like I, I can't express to you. It seems like you share this. I, oh, I absolutely hundred percent do. I feel like deeply. such a kept woman, but I hate it <laughs> deeply. Yeah. I deeply hate it. And, and turns out we were, we 
had this con actual conversation and he doesn't mind it. And so in our household, that's a job that he does. He folds mm -hmm. the laundry. Um, and, you know, we've had 10,000 other little micro discussions like that of figuring out who's going to do what and who feels comfortable doing whatever. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I think that thinking about tasks at, at home and at work like that is, is the way, mm -hmm. the way to having a sane life. <laughs> Absolutely. I love that. Well, I think that's a perfect place to actually end there is to kind of reminding our, reminding our listeners that, that they don't have to do it all. And matter of fact, probably aren't doing it as well as they think they are. Um, I have made it my mission to hire people who are 10 times better at the things I think I'm great at. And it's helped a lot with the business. And it sounds like you've done the same thing. So it's so wonderful to talk with you, Juliet. Thank you so much for your time today. And um, we'll check back in with you in a couple of months and see how you are. Thank you so much. And thank you for doing this work for people. I think it's so important, uh, the message that you're getting out into the universe. So thanks for having me on. Thank you.